Evolution Impossible. That's the title of a book by John Ashton, who has a PhD. He's a fellow of the Royal Australian Chemical Institute. He's a fellow of the Australian Institute of Food Science and Technology. He's the strategic research manager for the Sanitarium Health Food Company in Australia. If you're curious, that's the one that, uh, that uh, used to make the uh, Weetabix, if I remember correctly, and a bunch of other stuff in Australia. And uh, he's the author of In Six Days, Why 50 Scientists Choose to Believe in Creation. Um, I was asked to write a chapter for that book, and R.L. Roth uh, wrote another chapter for that book. Um, so we're somewhat familiar with it. He's also an author of Unwrapping the Pharaohs, How Egyptian Archaeology Confirms the Biblical Timeline, which I have uh, mostly read now and um, argues, well, somewhat argues for a short age for um, the uh, a chronology of the Pharaohs. And he's the author of uh, A Chocolate a Day, as in Keeps the Doctor Away, but which is kind of an interesting, uh, uh, he has uh, obviously varied interests. Um, he is the adjunct professor of biomedical sciences at Victoria University and adjunct professor of applied sciences at Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. He got his Bachelor of Science in Chemistry at the University of Newcastle. He got his Master's in Chemistry at the University of Tasmania and the MS, and he got his PhD in Epistemology from the University of Newcastle. It's a slightly different field. Uh, interestingly, in Wikipedia, there is a, apparently, uh, they put up a web uh, page for him and in defense of their keeping the web page, they mentioned that he is a fellow of the Chemical Society. He's adjunct professor uh, at the Royal something Institute of Technology, at Royal Melbourne, I think it is. Uh, adjunct professor, honored in the University of Sydney. These are positions substantially higher prominence than the average professor that is a faculty member in North America. And yes, they spelled it that way. Um, this is stolen straight from the page and with um, uh, no changes in their quotes or even. Even if considered below full professor in the Australian system, and in six days has had an in-depth review by Groves, plus mentioned by Dawkins, plus widespread mention, and the chocolate books has m have numerous reviews, so they said we really have to put this guy in, even though he's a creationist. Now. That doesn't mean Wikipedia ignores all creationists. Ariel Roth has his own web page. Interestingly, Ariel invented uh, the argument over irreducible complexity before Michael Behe did. That's courtesy of Wikipedia. Uh, of course, Michael Behe's article has been refuted, but. Uh, <laughs> Yes. A anyway, uh, so so it's kind of uh, this is a this is a person with some reasonable uh, uh, training and experience. Uh, the book itself, Evolution Impossible: Twelve Reasons Why Evolution Cannot Explain the Origin of Life on Earth, um, and we'll go to the the uh, book itself as soon as I can. It's uh, dedicated to Henry Zwill, who used to be at uh, Union College, if I remember correctly. Uh, he graduated from Roman University Department of um, So he graduated from here, and uh, I know Henry. And it has a preface by somebody named Warren Grubb, who's a PhD in Australia, apparently. And I'll just give you a little flavor. This is what he begins with in his introduction. Some time ago, I was meeting with university professors from a highly regarded Australian university. Uh, the university professors, who am I? There's something missing. Um, 
Well, we can go back to the original source. Um, they were involved in plant breeding research. Yeah, I don't know how that didn't get through. And we were discussing a possible collaborative research project, breeding disease res resistance traits into a newly developed functional cereal grain. The breeding techniques included treating seeds with chemicals that damage their DNA. The resulting mutant seeds were then germinated and tested for any beneficial traits that might have resulted from the changes. The new grain cultivar we were discussing possessed a favorable variation due to the destruction of part of a gene. This loss of genetic material meant that the new plant produced a grain with less easily digestible starch. This grain potentially could be made into foods with significant benefits in the prevention and management of type 2 diabetes. Over lunch, I was thinking of the role of mutations in relation to the theory of evolution. For a new species to evolve from a common ancestor, new genetic information must arise, presumably from some sort of favorable mutation. So while we were sitting around the lunch table, I asked the research scientists in charge of the plant breeding project a question. Do mutations ever give rise to new purposeful genetic information? His answer was immediate. Of course, yes. Can you give me an example, I then asked. He thought for a moment and replied along the lines of, um, I can't think of a specific example right now, but ask our geneticist, he will be able to. Later that afternoon, I caught up with the senior genetics researcher in the university plant breeding department and asked him the same question. His reply was just as quick, but the very opposite, never. Surprised, I pressed him further. He explained that mutations always lead to damaged DNA, which usually results in the loss of genetic information. He knew of no instances where new purposeful genetic information arose, either by a natural process or through a mutation induced chemically or with radiation. I thought about these two responses. The older, more experienced scientist believe mutations can produce new purposeful genetic information. And I dare say that the other scientists around the lunch table working in related biological fields believed likewise. They certainly did not correct the first answer. It seemed likely to me that most scientists who put up their hand for believing in evolution would also agree that mutations can produce new genetic codes, providing new traits for the forces of natural selection to choose from for new species to evolve. But if the geneticists were correct, and mutations never produce new purposeful genetic information, evolution, as the cause of life on Earth, was impossible and could not have happened. As I thought about this, I decided to begin researching and writing this book. So that gives you an idea of where he's coming from. Uh, the rest of the introduction just uh, fills in a few details. And what I'm going to do is go through the outlines of what he has to say, uh, comment here, there, and then um, uh, close with my own observations. Uh, the first chapter is entitled, But Isn't Evolution a Fact? And um, he collects multiple sources that state evolution is a fact. Um, and. Uh, However, his own experience, again, sa he says, I could not find a single paper reporting the evidence that supports the fundamental requirement of evolution, that new meaningful genetic information arises by chance. Which, of course, means that his original question was answered by a negative literature search as well. Um, he attributes the scientific belief in that, largely to peer pressure, and he cites the movie Expelled. Um, and then he mentions several people who, in fact, find it difficult to believe that new meaningful genetic information arises by chance. Um, the Wistar Institute, um, Barbara Stahl, Michael Denton, Werner Gitt, Lee Spetner, Kirshner, and Gerhard 
Jerry Fodar, the Altenberg 16, and Stephen Meyer. Not all these people, of course, are um, believers in God. But they all feel that the present evolutionary uh, explanation is inadequate. The second chapter introduces Darwin's theory of evolution, and he talks about the tree of life, homology, wingless beetles, and the idea that on an island uh, they're more likely to be wingless beetles than the winged beetles because flying is hazardous, you can get blown into the sea, and in fact on the uh, leeward side there are less wing beetles than there are on, on the windward side. Uh, humans and chimpanzees are 96 percent similar um, which he takes relatively uncritically. I think that um, there's some pretty good evidence that that's a, an optimistic figure, um, uh, if not totally unrealistic, that it's closer to 70 percent or so. We talked about that uh, in one of our talks. Um, and he talks about Heckel's embryos and makes the usual points on them. Um, chapter three is why a living cell cannot arise by chance. And uh, he says uh, spontaneous generation is commonly assumed. In fact, if you're going to go the full bore atheist, non-interventionist uh, uh, route, you pretty much have to assume spontaneous generation. Ashton disagrees with radiometric dating for reasons that he'll outline later. He uh, talks about panspermia. Uh, he mentions uh, uh, Fred Hoyle as a proponent. Interestingly, he for some reason misses Francis Crick in this regard. Uh, and he mentions that Dawkins made uh, the surprising admission that he did that um, that really panspermia was not a completely crazy um, idea, as long as, of course, the uh, creatures that sent life to Earth had evolved themselves on the other planet. E. coli has 2,737 uh, genes, and mycoplasma genitalium has 471. And uh, that seems to be the smallest number. Well, he doesn't say this, but there, there's some suggestion that you could get by with 250 if all you have to do is reproduce DNA. Of course, um, you still have to figure out what you're going to eat or how you're going to get energy. And that's one of the weaknesses of, the, uh, of that kind of reduction of uh, uh, organisms to their s uh, smallest denominator. Mycoplasma genitalium has to be fed very specialized broths, which are not likely to have been found on Earth back uh, when uh, mycoplasma would have been the only organism. Uh, he goes on to mention that biopolymers tend to break up faster than they form, which means, of course, that if you're trying to do this without the benefit of enzymes and uh, that uh, you're trying to roll a rock uphill and uh, in fact what you're trying to do is you're trying to say the rock rolled uphill by itself which is um, really hard to believe. Um, he mentions that uh, we can't produce life from dead bacteria. So you go from inorganic molecules to organic molecules to polymers to systems to uh, an assembly just ready to turn into life and then finally to life and you can't even do the last step, at least not with the technology we have at present. And uh, then he zeroes in on this, uh, there are those 471, if I were saying it I would probably go back to 250 just to be as generous as I possibly could, but to take one of those and try to create it from scratch with amino acids, the probability is 10 to the minus 190, and he mentions that the universal probability bound is 
probably somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 10 to the 150, of course, citing the work by uh, uh, Bill Dembski. And I, Dembski, I think, has a point uh, in this regard. So that's chapter three. Chapter four talks about why new types of organisms cannot evolve by random mutations. He quotes Dawkins in The Greatest Show on Earth, The Evidence for Evolution, as uh, saying, in the rest of this book, I shall demonstrate that evolution is an inescapable fact. There are three types of evolution, um, says John Ashton, and I agree with him on this. Type one evolution is the loss of genetic material or change in allele frequency. Basically, the information is already there. You lose it, or perhaps there are two sets of information, and you can go from one to the other. Uh, and that does not involve any gain in information. Type 2 evolution is taking a gene from one particular kind of organism and uh, somehow getting it into another kind of organism. That involves a gain of information by the organism that receives the information. But it's not a total gain because the information was already there in some other organism. And then type 3 evolution is totally brand new, useful genetic evolution that, or information that does not come from someplace else. And that kind of evolution, uh, there's only one example that's claimed in the literature according to him and that um, or I should say that's claimed by Dawkins, according to him. And uh, that kind was the experiments of Lenski that allowed E. coli to metabolize citrate. And he says when you actually look at it very closely, it turns out that that's type 1, not type 3. It's loss or slight change in genetic information, not a brand new enzyme. And then he finishes uh, by saying that mutations cannot produce the new genetic information needed for type 3 evolution to occur. He then moves on to the fossil record, which he says is evidence for extinction, not evolution. He discussed the fossils in general. He discusses geological principles which go back to Nicola Steno. Um, Interestingly, Nicola Steno was originally Stenson. Uh, and uh, those of you who may remember Stenson's duct, that's actually named after him, the duct from the parotid gland to the, the mouth. So he had wide interests. And then William Smith, um, who was one of the early people uh, in England looking at the geological strata. And then he talks about Hutton and Lyell and notices their bias towards long age. And notice in particular that uh, Lyell um, went to visit uh, Niagara Falls, talked to the people around, and they said it's been receding three feet a year. And he said, no, it's not. It's only receding one foot a year. And on the basis of that, figured that Niagara Falls was about 35,000 years old because it has a gorge that's about 35,000 uh, feet uh, back to where it originally started. And uh, uh, it turns out that the locals were uh, probably slightly inaccurate. It's more like four to five feet a year, so his estimate is even further off. Um, he talks about fossil, uh, Ashton talks about fossils formed in, uh, just a minute. <coughs> I'm sorry. Yes. When I see something like this, 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 this just bothers me to no end. Um, why would anybody assume that the recession rate would be constant? I mean, obviously. <laughs> If you encounter soft material, you would go through it faster. If you can encounter hard material, you would go through it slower. 
this this stands to common sense. I mean, why would people jump to these kinds of extrapolations that 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 are really just with no basis in sound common sense? Well, the the reason why is because Lyell was trying to transform geology into a science. And by science, I mean something that's perfectly predictable. Well, you can't predict things if everything's been varied for all, the, for all time. And so, uh, well, you can, but you have to go through a lot more work than Lyle was willing to do. He was a, geolo uh, a, a lawyer by training, not a geologist. So if it sounded good, it, it, it probably was better than uh, if, it, if it could be reduced to scientific <coughs> first principles. Um, I'm being a little hard on Lyell, but then, as it turns out, Lyell was wrong about this, and pretty much everybody now uh, has given up on strict uniformitarianism. Why and uh, I think it's particularly interesting that Lyell starts out by saying that the data are wrong and they're more like what I want them to be, and then he applies the rules. I, I, I think that's probably even more uh, damning than uh, than that he applied the rules. If I may, in, to wish to make something more scientific is a noble goal. But one doesn't render a field more scientific by multiplying assumptions. One renders it more scientific by producing more data. That's how science develops. And by understanding Anybody. the data and by constantly right. testing the exactly. hypothesis that one tries to draw from the data. That's right. Uh, Multiplying um, assumptions does not give us wisdom. Well, um, that's one of the reasons why Lyell is not a common textbook in geology today. Um, he talks. That's right. That's right. And of course, if there was a higher volume of water, it might have eroded uh, further, just in case somebody wants that in the middle. So uh, <laughs> he notes that there are a number of different extinctions. The, uh, the most prominent two being uh, at the end of the uh, the second one being at the end of the Cretaceous, which is at the end of the Mesozoic. And interestingly, the first one is at the end of the Permian, which is at the end of the Paleozoic. So there are a lot of uh, extinctions that happen, but, uh, but not particularly uh, changes from one form to another. Uh, he talks about dinosaur footprints hell heading the same way. Um, and it doesn't matter what kind of dinosaurs they were, uh, almost suggesting that they're running away from something. Um, and he talks about dinosaur eggs with embryos and soft tissues, which imply some kind of catastrophe and fairly rapid burial. And finally, he talks about the Cambrian explosion, which is perhaps premature, but um, I guess if you're saying that not evolution um, um, you're introducing it here now instead of uh, in the next chapter, um, but it will come up again. Um, he talks about the missing fossils of evolutionary intermediates, which are evolution that uh, evidence that evolution never occurred. And uh, he mentions the claim, uh, primarily by Richard Dawkins, but by many other people as well, that fossils show intermediates predicted by Darwinian evolution. Um, in fact, if you get into debates, uh, if you look at some of the debates, the, it used to be the horse series that was brought up all the time. Uh, it's now primarily the whale series that's brought up. But um, Dawkins pulls up the fish to amphibians and the Tickalik story. Um, he points out that number one, the mechanism was not really shown, and number two, the, fo the fossils that they're trying to be said as intermediate are not truly intermediate. 
they're still either fish or uh, amphibians and pretty easily distinguishable. He quotes uh, Ariel Roth, uh, citing Origins, which uh, he's rather impressed with your book. Um, and he specifically notes uh, uh, birds and especially turtles, where there is no intermediate from having the shoulder girdle outside the uh, rib cage to having the shoulder girdle inside the rib cage. There's nothing that's halfway there. Um, and he notes plants. I might add, if he'd wanted to, he could have used marine invertebrates where the same rules apply. It's interesting that uh, vertebrates seem to be the one place where evolution kind of halfway sort of works. And then, of course, he mentions the Cambrian explosion where all these animals are there suddenly with no intermediates in between. And finally, he cites Gould, and who's rather famous for saying that we have to account for stasis in the absence of intermediates in the fossil record. And of course, that's what led to his pr proposing punctuated equilibrium. Uh, he talks about the geologic re uh, evidence for a catastrophic global flood. He mentions the fact that there's so much sedimentary rock. Um, uh, he talks about catastrophism, which has made a comeback with uh, Derek Ager in, particularly, in particular, and um, that there are worldwide deposits in some cases. The chalk deposits are found all over the world, including, of course, the cliffs of Dover. And um, there are widespread deposits of various things. He mentions the uh, Cinerum conglomerate and the, and the uh, Morrison Formation uh, as I think most of us have run into that sometime or other. Uh, he talks about uh, overthrusts. And if you read him carefully, I don't think that he wants to say that the, that the geologic column is all mixed up so much as he wants to say that it was all soft at the same time, which is probably a better uh, use of uh, the data than uh, to claim that uh, the, ge the, the geologic column is completely uh, crazy. He mentions polystrate trees, trees that go through more than one stratum, and trying to imagine that you know this one took 10,000 years and this one took 10,000 years, and so the tree sat for 30,000 years without rotting or being worn off or eaten by um, uh, beetles or something. Uh, seems a little strained. Uh, he mentions Andrew Snelling uh, as uh, somebody who's collected a lot of uh, information of various kinds. Um, and then he talks a little bit about the Ice Ages and cites Michael Ord, but mostly leaves, if you really want to look at that kind of information, you're probably better off going to the original. At least if you're reading his book, you can find out where the original is. And I think that's helpful. Now, his eighth chapter is entitled Historical Evidence for a Worldwide Flood. Of course, he begins with the Bible, but then the Epic of Gilgamesh comes up quickly. There are Greek and Roman legends. Uh, he doesn't go into a lot of detail about uh, which legends match what, but he does uh, give you places to look for them if you want. Uh, there's Sanskrit legends that he cites. Um, there's a fellow by the name of David Leeming who's collected uh, some of these from all over, and uh, that includes uh, uh, Mande tribe in Mali in North Africa, or I guess technically East Africa, West Africa, I'm sorry. Um, uh, some Australian Aboriginal tribes, and the uh, Arakara Indians, which lived in the uh, center of the North America where uh, the United States now resides. Um, and he talks about the Chinese sites, um, uh, Ethel uh, Nelson's work. And uh, he proposes that 
what happened to the lifespans that are recorded in the Bible is that they were changed by uh, water that contained more deuterium. That apparently deuterium free water tends to be uh, more conducive to long life, which is kind of an interesting theory. I guess that the flood would have uh, allowed more water with deuterium in it to come up and, uh, and uh, give us shorter lives. I think that that's probably a simplification of what happened, and it may not even be the main factor, but uh, it's an interesting uh, point that he raises. And then he mentions the tilt of the Earth's axis, which if you follow it back, appears to have a component that um, fluctuates to one side and then the other of a standard curve until uh, you get to, depending on what you do with certain data in Egypt, either 4,000 or 5,000 years ago, when it appears to go off asymptotically and it uh, raises the question of whether the Earth is recovering from a catastrophe at that point. Uh, it's interesting data. He doesn't uh, give all of it, but he does give you some references that you can look up. His ninth chapter is entitled Erosion Rates, Sedimentation Rates, and Other Evidence in Conflict with Radiometric Dating Ages. Uh, basically, he's setting up radiometric dating to say that it's not the only way of dating the Earth. Um, before he begins to give you some of the reasons, he notes that the young earth view is rejected because it lends support to the Bible. Um, and it, he says the example of intelligent design shows that there is not a completely objective view of what's uh, going on uh, in the scientific community. And then he shows, uh, he talks about erosion rates, which uh, we're very familiar with in this class uh, from uh, Ariel Roth's uh, talks in the past. The lack of sediments, and then he mentioned something that I haven't seen that commonly before, and that is the lack of volcanic materials. That, um, not that there isn't any volcanic material in uh, the sediments, but that there's much less than you would expect from the number of volcanoes in the time that they're supposed to have been erupting. And he makes a pretty good case of it, actually. He talks about dinosaur tissue, the work of Mary Schweitzer and, and many others that uh, uh, we're familiar with. Uh, he talks about genetic entropy, which of course argues for a short age of life on Earth. Those of you who've attended Sanford's lecture or gone over our review of his book, we'll be familiar with that. And then chapter 10 is radiometric dating methods which give old ages for young rocks and other evidence of major problems with this method of dating. And uh, he discusses the methods in general. Uh, it's not an in-depth discussion, but it will at least give you kind of a, a bit of an orientation. Uh, he points out that there are false ages for zero age samples, that is samples for which we know the age because we have eyewitnesses that have watched these particular formations come out and they sometimes date to millions of years. And uh, rubidium strontium dating comes in for the biggest criticism of that, although you can do some of that same kind of thing with potassium argon ages as well. Uh, he doesn't mention that. And then uh, he mentions discordant dates, which of course, the converse argument has always been used that uh, well, these methods must be right because here's one method and here's the other method and they all give you the same age. Well, he says no. In the case of Somerset Dam in Queensland, Australia, in the case of the Grand Canyon, a uh, uh, couple of basalts there that have been dated by several different methods. In the case of the Hamas uh, granodiorite in New Mexico where th the uh, uranium Lead ages are quite different from the uranium helium ages. And uh, finally, Mount uh, Nagaraho in New Zealand. Now, most of you probably have seen Mount Nagaraho in pictures. Um, 
but just didn't recognize it. It's uh, Mount Doom in the uh, uh, movie series, uh, the uh, uh, the Return of the King, the Fellowship of the Ring series. Um, there are, uh, he then goes uh, to mention the uh, change in decay rates and he makes one unfortunate error and that is that he assumes that atomic clocks which can uh, be, ch uh, uh, which can change slightly depending on what happens with relativity are in fact uh, uh, nuclear decay when they're they're not actually their their processes are entirely different um, having nothing to do with nuclear resonance but rather atomic resonance uh, beryllium 7 he mentions that uh, that if you have enough pressure you can change the half-life I think that what he's trying to do is to say that uh, radiometric uh, decay is not something that is totally un influenced by outside sources and uh, if you take that as his meaning then uh, he makes a halfway decent case for it um, he could have done better I think by noticing some more recent changes uh, in radiometric decay rates but he doesn't go there uh, the Hemis granodiorite and radio halos he mentions as evidence for uh, accelerated decay. Uh, the radio halos are a little weak. Uh, the Hemis granodiorite is actually probably the strongest evidence that we have at this point. Um, uh, he mentions the plasticity of dates, that is to say that you can get what date you think you need. Um, and for that reason I think he correctly argues that if you're going to use radiometric dating it should be blinded otherwise it's not much use. The uh, KBS Tuff is probably the classic example where it started out as 200 million years plus it went to 2.9 million years and then when they found an unusual skull it went to 1.8 million years just depends on what people think it ought to be and you can back it up with the with a laboratory. That's of course not the laboratory that we're familiar with in, in medicine. <laughs> and finally he mentions carbon-14 dating which uh, he cites Andrew Snelling the, doing some early work. He cites my work at some uh, length and then uh, goes into the rate groups uh, data on coal and on diamonds. He still hasn't uh, at least uh, if when the book was written he was not familiar with the uh, stuff on dinosaur bones that was just recently uh, presented. Uh, in chapter 11 he, he takes aim at the Big Bang Theory which he says is not supported by observed data. He talks about the Goldilocks planet which is not really specific to the Big Bang although it, it could argue that if there was a Big Bang it was planned. He talks about carbon resonance where the carbon is able to or uh, carbon is able to be formed in stars when you would not have expected it because a particular nuclear resonance is there and interestingly although he doesn't mention this oxygen is missing that kind of resonance and therefore it's harder to form carb uh, oxygen from carbon than you would expect and without that, those two factors there would be, have been um, the, all the carbon that would have been turned into oxygen which of course would have meant that life on earth would have been impossible or at least very difficult uh, would have been impossible without divine intervention of course if it takes divine intervention in any way then that argument kind of falls apart. Um, and then he launches into his actual uh, uh, attack is probably a strong word but to his his comments on uh, the Big Bang and how it's uh, not as much 
of a done deal, as people would like to, to say. First of all, he points out that it's a product of naturalistic assumptions. And if you go down to the end of that list, you'll notice that the Copernican principle is one of the things that is being used as one of those assumptions, and that is that the universe looks pretty much the same from everywhere, which means that we do not occupy a special privileged position. If we do occupy a, pr a special privileged position, in fact, you can account for most of the observations that are made. Um, but nobody wanted to say after the Earth was not the center of the universe and the Sun was not the center of the universe and uh, nobody wanted to say that our galaxy was the center of the universe. Uh, and so that's the origin of the C Copernican principle. Um, the Big Bang does require a singularity, and that means that if you're going to go with the Big Bang, you're almost forced into a supernatural event. Um, but I think his aim is actually the Big Bang as a, an explanation without re recourse to superna the supernatural. If you, the question that he doesn't really address, I think, is that is could the Big Bang have been God's way of producing things? And the singularity is simply where God actually um, uh, decided to create the universe. And in which case, if you need to have things like inflation and dark matter and dark energy, God just did it that way. Um, the Big Bang without divine intervention does require inflation, does require dark matter, and does require dark energy, all of which are not observable phenomena except for their, um, if I can say this, paradigm-saving qualities, which means that the Big Bang has a certain uh, amount of ad hoc quality to it. Um, he says that the microwave background may not be f uh, evidence of the Big Bang originally. It may simply be space that is heated by starlight that uh, gives you that kind of a temperature background. One of the points that he makes uh, that I think is probably fair uh, is that there are not enough satellite galaxies for what you would expect from a, the Big Bang. Uh, suggesting that it's not simply that God turned everything loose and, and uh, let it go, but actually um, did a little meddling afterwards as well. Um, his twelfth chapter is called Highly Qualified Scientists Reject Darwin's Theory. And he mentions uh, his book in six days, Why 50 Scientists Choose to Believe in Creation, which was actually an answer to the idea that, well, no educated person believes in uh, uh, six-day creation. And that's how I got into his book, and that's how Ariel Roth got into his book. A number of other people got in, including uh, John Baumgartner, he, whom he quotes at length at this point. He, gives a quick summary of what some of these uh, scientists have said as reasons why they believe that uh, a six-day creation is closer to the truth than the standard uh, theory in science. Biochemistry, mutations, design in archaeobacteria, cytochrome C, the structure of oxygen, the origin of life, and thermodynamics. Those are obviously not a complete list. They're a very brief summary of some of the people who have written. Um, and then he mentions some other people that, um, well, uh, Andrew Snelling, I think, had a chapter in his book. Ariel Roth obviously did. Um, and so this is not uh, completely different from his In Six Days, but it includes some people who did not write John Sanford, Walter Veith, J Dwayne Gish, Colin Mitchell, Lee Spetner, Andrew Smelling, Ariel Roth, Werner Gitt, uh, Andy McIntosh, whom some of us have met, and John Hartnett. <laughs>
and uh, then he talks about evidence for the existence of an intervening God. And the idea, I think, here is to say that you can't just say, but God couldn't have done it because there is no God, because he says, uh, for example, the dream of Daniel 2 seems to validate uh, the book of Daniel and validate the God of Daniel. Um, the dream of Daniel 2 mentions and its fulfillment. He mentions uh, Belshazzar as a, as a support for Daniel himself. And he mentions Alexander the Great's visit to Jerusalem, where, which is not widely publicized, I think partly because many people feel that, well, that couldn't have happened, and therefore it just didn't, and therefore uh, Josephus was just making it up. Joan of Arc, he mentions as one of the uh, people that uh, God intervened in her life, which is kind of interesting because, of course, he's in the British tradition, and Joan of Arc is uh, not exactly uh, a British patriot. Um, and then he has stories of miracles and communications from God to, or from somebody, supernatural at least, to humans. And uh, he mentions a book that he wrote called The Seventh Millennium that collects a number of these. His final chapter is a summary, 12 evidence-based reasons for rejecting evolution. And uh, he mentions Dr. Gavriel Avital, who was the, uh, uh, in the Ministry of Education, uh, Israeli Education Ministry, who, who recently tried to give alternatives to evolution and was roundly criticized for it. Um, I think he may have lost his job over it. Um, but he says these 12 reasons that he gives are not exhaustive. Um, and here's the list. So this is, if you want the, the argument that he makes in a nutshell, here it is. Uh, mutations do not produce new purposeful genetic information. Evolution of a new species as a result of new genetic code arising has never been observed. <coughs> uh, there is no known prov proven mechanism that can explain how new purposeful genetic information could arise, and statistically it is impossible. There is no known proven mechanism that can explain all the steps for a living cell from non-living molecules or a biogenesis, and statistically it is impossible. Abiogenesis has never been observed, and all experiments to initiate it have failed. The fossil record is a record of extinction of fully formed animals and plants, not a record of the evolution of life forms. There are no fossils of proven mutant evolutionary intermediate organisms, yet there should be millions and millions of fossils of such mutation. That is why we have no evidence of actual evolution. The, excuse me, that is, we have no evidence of actual evolution in the fossil record. Some of the oldest fossil bearing rocks contain fully developed advanced animals such as trilobites with no evidence of evolutionary ancestors. Erosion rates for the continents are too fast for the continents and their fossil content to be old enough for supposed evolution to occur. There are not enough ocean sediments or volcanic uh, deposits for the continents to be old enough to allow for supposed evolution. Radiometric dating results give old ages for recent rock, so we cannot accurately know the ages of rocks. Also, the finding of carbon-14 in coal and diamonds means that these deposits must be less than 100,000 years old, indicating insufficient time for supposed evolution. And 12, finally, the rate of mutation of DNA currently observed suggests that DNA must be less than 100,000 years old, which is not enough time for the supposed evolution. So he finishes up with Sanford's argument. Now he says what he has to say is politically incorrect. Um, and he says one of the objections is what about pain and suffering? And he says that's answered by uh, an essay by, I assume that's John Pauline, 
who is uh, here in Loma Linda now, uh, who wrote The Problem of Evil in a book that he and another person um, edited uh, called The Big Argument, Does God Exist? And finally, at the end of the book, he has an appendix one, which is calculations of the approximate date for creation in the flood using data in the biblical record. So you can read why he thinks the earth is approximately 6,000 years old, not actually not quite yet. Now, my own take on this is that if you were to do an ideal creationist book, it would do many things. It would break new ground, so it's worth reading on its own. It would provide an exhaustive or at least an authoritative summary with, because almost no book is going to be exhaustive, perhaps footnotes so that people can follow up uh, if they want further information. It would shore up the belief in creation in those who are believers but are somewhat shaky. That's the easy target. The harder target is to convince those who are persuadable but on the other side of the creation evolution debate. And for that second one, it should be very careful to use evidence that will not be challenged or at least allow for the challenges if you use evidence that is going to be challenged. That means heavy influence, or uh, pardon me, heavy reliance on peer-reviewed articles. Um, one can argue that not all truth is peer-reviewed, and uh, I think make that argument stick. But uh, if you're having somebody who isn't sure whether they want to believe, I think that um, that that's probably it's probably not worth challenging that on a wholesale basis without having some kind of standard um, by which creationist uh, ideas and, and, uh, and evidence can be, uh, can be used. And finally, of course, it should be easily understandable and short. Now, obviously you can't do all of that at once. So you kind of have to pick and choose. Now, I think that that Ashton's book is relatively short as they go. Uh, it is uh, not quite as short as that Choose You This Day book that we talked about last week, but it's, it's fairly short. It's fairly up to date, it's accurate, and it's understandable. Um, it has good references for further study. I could perhaps improve on some of them, but, um, but in general it's pretty good. Uh, it's not, definitely not comprehensive. Um, it does have occasional mistakes. The one on uh, um, uh, atomic clocks probably being the most obvious one. Um, it occasionally gives a different take. I like his personal t talking about uh, um, uh, the creation of new genetic information, his uh, introduction, I thought was quite uh, captivating. Um, I would say it is worthy, it's not definitive, it's not absolutely necessary, but it's a worthy addition to the creationist literature. And with that, I will give you a chance to respond. Now, we have a um, comment back in the back there. Controlling the mic, I'll just to start off. Can we assume because he worked at sanitary, Sanitarium Foods that he's an Adventist? Uh, well, you don't have to assume that he is. Yes. I was impressed. I've only read through chapter 8, but uh, at the end of each chapter, my, re my response was, well, if that's all true, evolution doesn't have a leg to stand on. Then in this month's issue of Smithsonian, the question is asked, where did we get our water? Where did the water on Earth come from? And the answer is it came from comets and um, satel not satellites, uh, meteorites. The dust of the Big Bang, when it coalesced into the Earth, apparently had enough water to create our oceans. I found that to be as, as, as satisfying as the 
history of the formation of the geologic, geologic table column. It's just fanciful. And I, by the end of that chapter, I was laughing that people would actually believe the time scale in the geologic column. Well, I, I think that, um, that uh, Charles Lyell started an extrapolation. It got us um, hundreds, well, it got us probably tens to hundreds of millions of years. And then the radiometric dating raised it by about an order of magnitude. And what people are really looking at is radiometric dating as the one thing on which they hang their hat. I don't know of anybody who tries to explain, for example, why there are Paleozoic sediments still on top of Mount Everest. Um, if you take a straightforward uh, amount of uh, erosion that's taking place today and extrapolate it out straight, uh, you'd say that there's somewhere in the order of 70 miles of sediment that should have been removed by now. And the idea that the geologic column was 70 miles when Mount Everest started to rise is, um, I think, stretching it somewhat. So there are a lot of things that are just simply ignored. And if you bring them up to people, they go, where did that come from? Um, I'm hoping that some of the people who would be willing to believe in young age but have never been exposed to the scientific evidence go, oh. And that's the kind of thing I would like to see a book. I'm not so much interested in a book that reassures the faithful, although I suppose that it has that function too. Uh, I'd rather be able to persuade people who are uh, not persuaded at present. I'm a, an evangelist, if you want to put it that way, not so much of a uh, pastor in this regard. Uh, the very first chapter on statistics is overwhelming. The odds on these uh, things happening, life coming from non-life, just astronomical. After chapter one, you've got to give up evolution. Well, mechanistic evolution really, I think, has, is very difficult to defend. And so what most people do is they actually defend the age first. And once you have the age, you've done two things. You've taken the Bible out of the equation. And the second thing is that if you have a God, this is a God who's really kind of bumbling because he starts out making algae and then he finally figures out how to make body plans. And he does a wonderful job in the Cambrian. Uh, but then he kind of loses his touch and doesn't really get around to doing people until hundreds of millions of years later. Uh, in the meantime, having flunked out on most of the Ammonites and uh, a few other things like that. Uh, so, uh, the, the argument is really a theological argument, and a lot of people don't realize that. And this whole thing is really theology. Um, go ahead. Are you, You can use them both. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm trying to understand why the origin of water would be a problem because water is basically hydrogen and oxygen. So why the appearance of water would be a problem? And if it came from uh, somewhere else, you, I mean, I, I don't see that as an answer because... In other words, where did the water come from? If it came from another part of the universe, how did it appear there? In other words, is it that the oxygen, hydrogen is the basic element, right? Well, hydrogen is very plentiful in the universe in general. How about the oxygen? Uh, oxygen is one of the more prominent ele elements. And to actually get water itself is pretty easy, and uh, there's supposed to be water out there in, in, in outer space, um, mostly in the form of vapor because the pressure is so low. Um, the problem that you have is that, that the Earth has a 
for its size, a fairly massive amount of water. Um, I think that it's an interesting argument. I'm not sure that it's a convincing argument for the other side. The other side will believe that there was a lot of water on Mars at one time, and in fact there's a big, large, uh, Mars has its own version of the Grand Canyon. It's not quite as spectacular uh, in terms of uh, uh, depth, but it's, it's long and wide, and it is Although it's wide, its 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 absolute depth is actually compares well with the Grand Canyon, um, and so most people would say, "Well, Mars once upon a time had lots of water in it, and it's just lost it because it's a small planet and it's all evaporated off." Uh, Earth hasn't lost it because it's a larger planet; and it's harder for water to get off of uh, the planet. Um, this is one where. It, there may be an argument, but it's not felt by the other side, so I'm not sure how much I would use it unless I could document that the other side should be feeling it. I have another question uh, uh, regarding the uh, Grand Canyon. Uh, some time ago I was uh, debating or participating in a debate about the Grand Canyon and things like that. And uh, the person who was criticizing my views, and of course my views are very limited, as you know, but uh, this person said, you, you know nothing about dating because the Grand Canyon can be dated accurately. So I went to the internet and decided to uh, see what experts were saying about the date for the Grand Canyon. And I discovered that uh, the range was between 7 million years and 70 million years. So I said to this lady, I said, do you consider this accurate dating? I'm still waiting for a response. Well, that's, um, that's a problem. Actually, there are some that will say 1 million years. And um, of course, if you're a creationist, you're thinking in terms of thousands of years. And for the actual digging of it, probably more like tens or, or uh, maybe even years. Um, in fact, for the overburden, that is to say, the Grand Canyon, it has the inner gorge, it has the outer gorge. That you know, that's the part everybody looks at. But what people don't realize is that there used to be sediments that went all the way across, on top of all of that, and that's all gone too. And so the, the over canyon was probably taken out in terms of days or months, if you're uh, following a creationist standpoint. If you're not, you have difficulty explaining how all that stuff got out of there, where it went. Um, one of the advantages of having a flood is you can spread that over a large area once it gets done, and it may be harder to, to identify. If you're doing it by by means of the Colorado River, then it's got to go all into the delta of the Colorado River, which is not near big enough to take all of that sediment. I should point out that uh, it's uh, 11.30, and I know some of you have places you need to be. Well, uh, um, I agree. I, I think that it's, uh, it's a nice quick summary and, you know, if you don't have to have too much detail, uh, it's, uh, it gives the, the kind of the overarching uh, argument uh, in, a, in a pretty understandable uh, uh, fairly quick format. And that, I think, is the advantage of the book, is that it's actually likely to be read more than some of the other ones that, uh, that perhaps do a more thorough job. Um, Origins is encyclopedic. <laughs> That's okay. We need those, too, because there are people who need to have encyclopedic uh, references.
And in fact, what it does is origins can, find, can uh, serve as the backup for somebody who's doing a quick overview and saying, you know, if you want to know more about this, read origins. That's one of the advantages of having that kind of book. I know Ariel is impressed with the size of the sediments surface on the earth running through the middle of the United States. This book deals with that and mentions that in places you have to move huge areas some 200 miles, slip it along the surface of the earth. And he said it's been shown that you, you can't even move a half a mile without it shingling up. And yet they have these large planes moving some 200 miles along the eastern front of the Rockies. But like I say, it's, it, it's quick and, uh, and dirty, but uh, with enough references to where you can read a little more thoroughly about most of it. Um, I, I never can completely get into the mind of somebody else, but uh, I suspect that what happened was that uh, John Ashton wanted to do this for his own personal uh, belief system. And that when he got done, he thought, and uh, this is pretty good, and you know, it should be known by more people than just me. Um, and uh, I think that's, I think that's a very helpful uh, thing to do is to basically kind of take your personal journey. And every once in a while, in the in the book, you find these little references to himself. Uh, which I think add somewhat to the book. Yes. Uh, some time ago, I was reading a book by a physicist, a renowned physicist. I don't remember his name. I have a book in my library, but my memory is getting <laughs> weaker and weaker. And he was trying to explain the Big Bang. And he said the Big Bang is based on the rate of expansion of the universe, the microwave ra radiation. And the, uh, in turn, this is based on the size of the universe we know. Now, the size of the universe has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger because we have been building, uh, uh, how do you say, bigger telescopes. So are we trying to imagine that we already know what the size of the universe? And if we are saying that all this is contingent on the universe we know, and we are saying categorically that the Big Bang took place uh, what is 13.7 billion years ago, what's going to happen to this if we discover that uh, what we know about the size of the universe is just a small fraction of the actual universe? What will happen to the Big Bang at the date of the Big Bang? Well, um, that actually feeds into one particular variation of the many universes theory. Uh, and that is that we only see a part of the universe, the rest of it is actually beyond our ability to see, uh, and that the universe is much vaster than we had any idea. Of course, this gives more chances for life to develop, um, for life to originate uh, in the beginning, but usually not enough for people to be able to say uh, the spontaneous generation happened, had to happen somewhere and and uh, we are where it happened. And that's uh, the, reason we, uh, the reason we're here is because that's, this is where spontaneous generation happened and therefore uh, we, uh, uh, we're a selected universe. Now, of course, that still doesn't explain a number of different things. One of them is that makes the original expansion that much more uh, astounding because uh, with an unlimited universe uh, 
uh, you would think that if it all started as a very small area, that it would have collapsed in on itself. It weighs too much. Um, and that's one of the reasons why most people discount that. Um, yes? We have two comments, and then I'll probably close unless there's a major. What is the best reference that would give the creationist versus the evolutionist side of the congruence of all of the dating methods or the non congruence? The radiometric and ice rings and tree rings and whatever else. It depends on how you try to explain um, the the difference between radiometric dating and a standard creationist time scale. If you're going to try to explain it on the basis of uh, physical factors other than change in the decay rate, <coughs> you could do worse than to look at my book, Scientific Theology, in the chapter on uh, uh, Joshua and the Pentateuch, uh, where I go into radiometric dating uh, fairly thoroughly with uh, probably as many references as you're going to find anywhere else. Um, if you're going to explain it on the basis of changes in decay rates, probably the best place to look is the radioisotopes in the, na in the Age of the Earth book, the rate group. They've probably done as close to definitive work there as any place else. Uh, there are constantly new additions that take place, and probably somebody needs to re revisit that. Um, it may turn out that a combination of those two ideas is more correct than any other ones. And I don't even think that the last chapter has been written because I think we still have more data that needs to be collected. Could you uh, bring us a list next week? A list of what? The, those original two references plus the other ones you started to allude to. Um, uh, well, you mean just as a, as a slide? No, as a handout. Um, and if you want to just bring one copy, I have a Xerox machine. <laughs> Well, um, I suppose that I can. Um, uh, my, wor my work's on the internet, and uh, the ICR has put their work on the internet, so they're now available for free if you want them. Uh, the inter the uh, ICR ha comes in a book like this. Mine used to come in a book like that until La Sierra University de Press, Press decided to go out of business and no longer republished it. So. So could you put it on the internet on your site? It is on the internet on my site. That list? That one, yes. All right. Yes. I'd like to just make a comment or two about uh, Ashton's book. Uh, as a librarian, I'm, of course, very interested in any new book that comes out on creation. And I'd like to kind of classify them. You know, I'm a cataloger. Um, Ashton, I would rate, I haven't read the book, but I have a pretty good feel of it here after listening to you. Ashton, I would rate, along with Colin Mitchell's book, I forget the title of his book, it came out in the 1990s. He's a British uh, scientist, Adventist. I, Ashton mentions him in the book. Good. And I worked there uh, at Newbold College when Colin House was a lecturer there. So I've known him for years. In fact, he wanted to do a team effort. He wanted to involve me in doing a book on creation and the flood and so on. Um, the weakness of these two books is that it's based mostly on a very good survey of the secondary literature. They're not published scholars in the sense they're not publishing primary works of research and establishing a publishing record uh, 
with creation topics, but they've kind of, they're synthesizers, they're popularizers. And there is a place for it, it catches our attention, and many here have commented very favorably. Uh, the hardest books to write are the ones where you actually do the original research and slug it out, like Dr. Rowe's book, Origins, or Leonard Brand's Linking Science and Scripture. I mean, those are tough. They, they, involve, they involved actually an entire lifetime of experience, training, research, publication efforts in creationist and non-creationist journals and so on. I would say that my, uh, my work on uh, radiometric dating comes close to that kind of thing. It was uh, Right, in a maybe more narrow sense. Yeah. The two works that I mentioned are broad, broad, just like Ashton tries to cover the whole waterfront, but yours has certainly a very rightful place, too, in the stream of scholarly creationist literature. I would hope that we can see a little more of your type of literature and Dr. Rose and Dr. Brands. So as a librarian, I'm hoping there's a new generation coming along that can uh, really slug it out and, and do the, uh, the effort that it takes to, to publish. I'm kind of doubtful. I'm not, seeing, I'm not seeing that on the horizon, but maybe it's coming. I think one of the things that's happening, though, there, there, like I said, there are three. There's the, there's a kind of the broad general. There is the, there is the, what you might call encyclopedic approach. And then finally, there is the, there is the narrow, but, data focused approach. Um, that's the kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, that's the kind of thing that the uh, ICR did. And uh, uh, that uh, in, in the rate book, I mean, they have actually original right. data, and that, and, and that probably even more than the other ones is, uh, is sorely needed, but is coming more into line. And for that, I think that the dinosaur bone dating is just absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. And it's even more fascinating that somebody just uh, made their paper disappear. And now the news report this week shows that they found a mammoth in Russia with the blood squirting out of the carcass. Now, it, it's almost too good to be true. <laughs> And already they're talking about cloning it because blood will have a lot of DNA, probably. Yes. Yeah, that just came out in the last couple of days, probably. So uh, there are some exciting new developments like well, that. There, there's, um, there are carbon-14 dated mammoths that go all the way down to uh, matching the time of the, about the fourth dynasty of Egypt. So. No kidding. Uh, that's no. Uh, it's really quite I impressive, and uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how far down we can get with those. Um, that doesn't have a direct relationship to the conflict, although it does kind of suggest that maybe uh, some of the dates may be slightly exaggerated. Um, but the 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 dinosaur stuff. The dinosaur stuff does two things. One, it's really hard to explain from a long age perspective. Mm -hmm. It really is, and it's getting harder all the time. And the second one is dinosaurs are, uh, for want of a better word, sexy. You know, little kids grow up and they don't know anything about anything yeah. else, but they do know about dinosaurs. Geologically speaking, dinosaurs are a bestseller. <laughs> yes. If you want to mark, they're so marketable. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, all you have to say is Jurassic Park and, yeah. Yeah. you know. Um, so I think that uh, that's one of the last, uh, uh, I think we're starting to see something to where it will break into the, uh, uh, the general community in a way that will be very hard to ignore. I think you're right when you assess the new trend among creationist literature is to focus more on a given topic, more specialized. Um, ICR started this with Steve Austin, 
Uh, his monograph on Grand Canyon is still very well worth reading. I've read it recently. And a uh, lot of good, sound, scientific data. Now, I, for years I chided Austin in my mind. I never confronted him personally, but I said to myself, why doesn't Austin have a global model that he can launch? And this is the Steve Austin model. But um, you don't, maybe you, you don't have to do that anymore. Maybe well, time is to specialize. Well, I think that number one, um, if you're going to make a global model, you have to have a lot of the pieces. If you don't have the pieces, right. it's hard to put the puzzle together. Exactly. And I, and I think that that's one of the things, those things actually will interact with each other. Yeah. And that we will get better models as we have more pieces. Exactly. Thanks. Anyway, come back next week if uh, you want to see Science and Human Origins. And this is, interestingly, this is actually something that breaks some new ground in a number of different areas, and that's one of the reasons why I'm suggesting that we look at it. Um, I got mine on the, uh, the internet, Amazon.com. Uh, if, you, if you get it, it's very definitely well worth reading. <laughs>